taken a journey through the Bible. We started with Genesis. And we see there a picture of God's sovereignty in the book of Genesis. Then last week we did the book of Exodus. See God's omnipotence or his power. Then as we get to Leviticus, we take a look at God's holiness. God's holiness. Leviticus, I have entitled it, God's Picture Book of Worship. I have to bear with me just a moment. This may be a concert for you or a symphony or whatever. Imagine you're spending an evening at the symphony or the concert and the orchestra is in the middle of a soothing presentation of your favorite song, Antonio or Antonio Vivaldi's The Four Seasons. Then suddenly the music stops. The conductor faces the audience, begins explaining the technical aspects of the composition. Notice how the fermata punctuated that last measure, he says proudly. Were you moved to tears by that dotted eighth rest? You want to cry, all right? Not because of a dotted eighth rest, because you're sad the music stopped. You, uh, and Leviticus often has the same effect on many readers. Uh, they're reading through Genesis and Exodus and the narratives flowing through and things are happening. And then all of a sudden they come to the book of Leviticus. It starts talking about ceremonial and sacrificial details. Anxious for the flow to continue or the music to continue. Many readers rush through Leviticus or they bypass it altogether. They bypass it. A lot of people never read through the book of Leviticus. But just as the underlying technical elements of musical composition are essential to its overall performance, so Levitical is crucial to the symphony or the flow of Scripture. It may be a little cumbersome and sound a little unnecessary at first, but the more you listen to it, the more you read it, the more we'll come to appreciate its beauty and its placement in God's revelation. The editors of the New Geneva Study Bible expressed the importance of Leviticus this way. It's important to try to understand the rituals in Leviticus for two reasons. First, rituals enshrine, express, and teach those values and ideas that society holds most dear. By analyzing the ceremonies described in Leviticus, we can learn about what was most important to the Old Testament Israelites. Second, these things are foundational for the New Testament writers, particularly the concept of sin, sacrifice, and atonement found in Leviticus are used in the New Testament to interpret the death of Christ. Leviticus speaks to humanity in every age, reminding us the depth of our sin, but also pointing us to the sacrifice of him whose blood is far more effective than the blood of bulls and goats. And so we see those things that we read about in the New Testament are laid here as a foundation in the book of Leviticus about sin and about what, how do we take care of that sin, what kind of life we should live as God's children. So we take a look at this book and its pencil portraits of Christ. A little history helps us there, a little bit of background. Uh, again, that name Leviticus. Leviticus is the Latin form of the Greek title. Remember the Greek version of the Old Testament, which was written in Hebrew, was called the Septuagint. And uh, if you weren't here, uh, we've mentioned that several times. But this is the Latin version of the Septuagint. It called it Leviticus. This is pretty, uh, this is pretty astounding, but it means about Levites. <laughs> or pertaining to the Levites. That's what that word Leviticus means. Remember who the Levites were. They were the tribe from Israel, which the priests were drawn. They were responsible for maintaining Israel's worship facilities and practices. And remember at this time, they have a portable worship building, the tabernacle. And the, and the Levites haul it. <laughs> they put it up. They take it down. The priests were also taken. The title is that because the book is primarily about worship. And what do I have to do to partake in worship 
of the God of the Bible. However, it's not addressed solely to priests or Levites, but also to the Israelites to tell them how to offer sacrifices and to enter the presence of God in worship. And remember, when you look at that tabernacle, when you get inside, you know, there was a holy place, then there was the holy of holies. And nobody could go past that curtain. And uh, uh, so we'll be looking at that. Why was Leviticus written? And what purpose did it serve in the life of the Israelites? The book of Exodus, remember, chronicles the deliverance of the Hebrew people, about two million of them coming from Egypt. God delivered them from Egypt to himself to make them a holy nation, God's own possession. Turn with me back to Exodus. If you have your Bible there, Exodus 19, just for a little review there. Exodus 19, as we looked at this book last week and the week before. Exodus 19, in verses 5 and 6, God says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, I circle that word if. <laughs> it means people have a choice. You're going to do what God says or you're not going to do it. It says, If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. You say, well, that's Old Testament stuff. Well, now turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. That's on the other end of your Bible. And you wonder sometimes where the writers of the New Testament got some of their information. Well, it's right out of the Old Testament. First Peter, chapter 2, verse 9. But you, Christians, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. That's you. That's what he's talking about. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He said you are a chosen generation. God chose you. And you're now a priest. Do you understand that? You are a priest. You can go right into the very presence of God. You no longer have to have a mediator. You walk right in. Just only the priest could do once time a year on the Day of Atonement, which is set forth in Leviticus there. One day, started in Exodus, but celebrated in Leviticus. And you can go and proclaim His praises, and you can talk to God. And, uh, and so, because God has delivered you from Egypt. Every person here is a believer. God has delivered you from Egypt, and He's made you His own special people. You're a special person. I know I tell you I'm special needs. But we're all special people in God's eyes. God chose you. He loved you. It's just like when you go to adopt somebody. You know, you've all been adopted into God's family. He chose you and adopted you. He, God picked you. <laughs> You're special. And I, I want you to pick that up. The content of Leviticus was given to the Israelites. Oh, no, my back up here. The details to how... The Israelites were to become a holy nation. God had pulled them out of a sinful situation. He's going to turn them into a holy nation, but God tells them how. When God saves you, he's wanting to change you into the image of his son. He's going to tell you what? How to do that. He doesn't just leave you there. Oh, I'm chosen. I'm God's child. Now what do I do? You don't have to answer. God answers those questions. He's going to tell them how they were to revere God. The respect Remember, as we talked about Moses, when that burning bush and God says, take off your sandals for the place you are standing is holy. How do I get inside to the very presence of God? That was a question that would be asked at this time. And then how they were to treat one another. How am I supposed to act toward a brother and sister in the Lord? We're all part of one family, remember? 
And uh, how am I supposed to do that? And how they were to reflect God in every area of life. And we'll look at that as we go along. Uh, I'm supposed to be a light, salt in this world. And God, I'm supposed to be an expression of God to these people around me. The whole world. The content of Leviticus was given to the Israelites during the year they camped at the foot of Mount Sinai. Remember God took them through the Red Sea. Killed the Egyptian soldiers, book of Exodus. And then they camped at the base of Mount Sinai for a year. This was after they left Egypt, before their wilderness wanderings. Uh, so that's kind of gives you a little timeline there. Uh, commentator R. Laird Harris explains that during that year, I, I tell you what, Moses had a job to do. He had over two million people. And remember, they grumbled and complained all the time. This is a group of grumblers and complainers. A lot like us, right? <laughs> we grumble and complain all the time, you know, uh, and point the finger at somebody else. But anyhow, Moses spent 80 days on the mountain with God. Then the people of Israel, at Moses' instruction, built the wilderness tabernacle. During this year, Moses organized the nation, built up the army, established courts and laws, and ordered formal worship. It was a busy year. Although most of the laws that Moses drew up at that time are found in Exodus and Numbers, Levitic is the law book par excellence. So it's here that he enforces these things that he told them. How to become a holy people, a people set apart for God. While camped at the foot of God's mountain, the Israelites learned that God was interested in more than just rescuing them. See, it's not all about laws, rules, and all that. He was interested in having a relationship with them. God's desire is to have a relationship with you. It was the Jews. See, they got it all messed up. They thought it was all about keeping the rules. Well, the rules were there for a reason. But God was interested in fellowshipping with them. Remember what God did in the garden in Genesis? He walked in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. And then sin broke that apart. Separated man from God. And now God's given them a way that they can be back and have that relationship restored. It started there in the garden. Remember he killed an animal and made clothing for them. First time death of an animal was there in the garden. Because they were vegetarians up to that point. And so... Uh, uh, we see that's what, well, and he was willing to come down from his mountain to dwell among them and bridge the gap between deity and humanity. God initiates that. Because if God didn't, there's no way we could ever get back in a right relationship with God if God didn't initiate that. Leviticus falls neatly into two main sections. I gave you a couple outlines there. One is a timeline kind of thing. The way to God and the walk with God. And uh, it's lifestyle and access. How do I get to God when at that time nobody except for the high priest one time on the Day of Atonement went in to the very presence of God and sprinkled blood on the, on the altar there? The way to God. And then that's what I have on my book. I, I write my Bible, as we've been doing, as we've been going along. And Leviticus I have open in there. I have what written in my Bible. That's Latin form of the Greek title. Leviticus, it means about Levites or pertaining to the Levites. That's really astounding. And it talks about God's holiness. And I tell you what, folks, this is a, a generation that has lost the picture of how holy God is. We, we have God as the man upstairs. Give me a break. If he's just a man upstairs, we're in bad shape. <laughs> that means we're out. Whatever's happening is happening. There's nobody in control of it. But God is in control of that. You know, I understand sometimes when I get that because Jesus came as a man and he is a friend of sinners. But don't lose the respect and the reverence for the holiness of God. He's pure. He's righteous. He's light versus darkness. And it's just all those amazing things. And, uh, we'll, and the first one we see the way to God, chapters 1 through 17. So I wrote that in my Bible. And then in chapters 1 through 7, we saw laws concerning offerings. 
laws concerning offerings, chapters 1 through 7 is on your outline. I write that in my Bible so that I have it for reference. And his mercy, that's not giving us what we do deserve. You understand that? That's what mercy is. We all deserve what? Hell. <laughs> Forever and ever and ever. But God in his mercy didn't give us that. Because of his grace, he made us his own special people. And that's God's unmerited favor. And uh, so in his mercy, God provided a way for sinful humanity to approach their holy God. Of course, we know ultimately that's this. The cross. That's where God's holiness met man's sinfulness at Calvary. But here, uh, we're looking in Leviticus where that stage was set. And we see that through a blood sacrifice, the innocent dying vicariously for the guilty. Otherwise, they were supposed to take an animal. And this animal was innocent. And it was certain animals, certain age, <laughs> certain qualities that had to take place. Christ fulfilled all those things. But they had to take this animal and offer it as a sacrifice. Why? Because they sinned. And as we go along, you're, going to be, you're so thankful today that we don't have to do that. That we don't have to kill an animal every time we sin. Leviticus 17.11, we're going to jump you ahead there just a little bit in your Leviticus, is one of the Key verses, there's four of them uh, listed there on your paper. Leviticus 17 11 says this <clears throat> Excuse me. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. That's why I, I told you I believe when we're resurrected, we're going to be without that quality. We won't have, our new bodies won't have blood. Uh, Jesus said that. I'll, I'll tell you later. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. You drain the blood out, guess what? You're dead. <laughs> That's what it's talking about, life and death. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. So That's the problem. We need to deal with our souls. We need to deal with our souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. So when we see blood being poured out is to make atonement. That word atonement means to cover over. To cover over. When you kill that animal, it covered over your sin. Now there's a difference between that and what Jesus did for you. Jesus was the Lamb of God. And when he died and shed his blood, he paid your sin debt in full. It wasn't just covered over. When he died, actually he died, paid the price for all the sins <laughs> of those folks all throughout the Bible. All the sins past, all the sin present, and all the sin for the future. He paid it in full. So guess what? You don't have to keep on offering the gift. That's what the book of Hebrews will tell us about. Sounds strange about a blood sacrifice. You know there's groups that have taken that out. There's power in the blood. We sang that one. One of Janet's favorite. There's power in the blood. Have you been washed in the blood? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Uh, all those songs, a lot of people have taken those out of their hymnals. That's barbaric. Well, I'll tell you what, without that shed blood, there's nobody here going to heaven. So you better be glad that God set it up. And uh, he's... Uh, Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9, 22, chapter 9, verse 22. And I, I just want to let you see how these things are tied in together with the New Testament. We, we have a famous preacher not too long ago told us you don't need the Old Testament. All you need is the New Testament. Well, I tell you what, folks, if you don't have the Old Testament, don't read the book of Hebrews. Because the Hebrews is all about the Old Testament and how Christ is so much better than that. But in chapter 9, verse 22, and according to the law, that's the Old Testament under Moses, the law, all things are purified with blood. And you'll see later on as they set those things forth, even the priest and the clothes they wear all had to be sprinkled with blood. Nice, huh? I wondered how that smelt after a while. 
had to be a stinking mess. Because if you've ever been around butchering animals and all those things after a while, that blood just stinks after a while. So everything they did. And sometimes during the sacrifices, the rivers would flow red from blood being poured in there and stuff. And I'm thinking, who did it have to stink? And the flies and all that. But anyhow, that's the way it was. Because why? And it says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission or no remission of sin. And so blood had to be shed that our sins could be paid for. And uh, that's what God set up. And uh, God says, if you want to receive forgiveness and cleansing, we got to come to God on his terms. Man trying to make their way to God is called religion. Religion doesn't save anybody. Relationships save somebody. When you ask Christ to save you, you become a child of God. And uh, that's the difference between religion and relationships. But that's the plan God put together. So he put it together. In the first seven chapters of Leviticus, God prescribes the proper manner for the Hebrew laity and priesthood to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Five top types of offerings all depict a different characteristic of Jesus Christ, the ultimate sacrifice. I gave you a copy of it there. should be on your outline. Levitical offerings, and on this side it says a picture of Christ. The burnt offering, spoken of in chapter 1, chapter 6, verses 8 through 13, speaks of his total consecration to his Father's will. Does that remind you of anything in the Bible? Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a what? A living sacrifice. That's a burnt offering, folks. Get on there in total consecration to the Lord. That's what God wants. That's what the burnt offering pictured. Grain offering, chapter 2, verses 6, and chapter 6, verses 14 through 23, talks about his sinless service. He was the sinless son of God. We even talked about that during the communion time where those wafers that, that are made that have nothing in them, oh, they're, they're hard to get down. But the reason they did that was the picture, the picture of Christ's sinlessness. He was pure and holy and sinless. If he wasn't, he couldn't become your sacrifice. Peace offering, chapter 3 and then chapter 7, 11 through 36 expands on that. His work on the cross what enables us to fellowship with God. When Christ died on the cross, remember what happened? That curtain that separated the Holy of Holies ripped from the top to the bottom. Now you can walk right into the very presence of God anytime, any place, anywhere. You don't have to go to the temple. You don't have to go to the priest. You don't have to go to the church. You can walk right in any time. Have fellowship with God. Anytime. I tell folks, go in there anytime. When you're happy, when you're mad, when you're glad, when you're sad. <laughs> you're mad at God? Tell him. Might as well. He knows already. He already knew it. Talk to him. Fellowship with him. Sometimes just unloading your heart to God just does amazing thing to you. You can do that. You can have fellowship with God. When I need direction, when I need help, I need strength. I've been working on a roof all week, six days. My wife says, you tired yet? And I said, I was tired when I started. <laughs> so what I do every day, I say, Lord, give me strength to carry another bundle up the roof. Get it on the shingle, get it on there. Every day I ask him for strength. When I'm working, it gets hot ready to have a fit because something's not going right. I said, Lord, help me out here. Uh, <laughs> I got a stinking attitude right now. I'm in the middle of the desert and I'm like those Israelites. I'm starting to grumble and mumble and murmur. I, I talk to him like that. I'm up there, probably, probably people think I'm nuts. I'm up there talking. And, you know, I always tell people I am nuts. I'm just screwed onto the right bolt. And so I talk to him and I tell him and I fellowship and, and that's what's there in that peace offering because the Bible says that when Christ died for me, I now have peace with God. Amen. And since I have peace with God, now I can have the peace of God which passes all understanding. And it says how to get that? Prayer. Through prayer. What's prayer? Talking to God. <laughs> it's, not make it all, it's not really that complicated. When you're having issues in your life, talk to the Lord about it. Let him know. 
he says he's there for us and that path was opened up because of that pictured in the peace offering. The sin offering, uh, chapter 4 and verse 1, and then chapter 5, verse 13, uh, through 5, 13, and then 6, 24 through 30, his bearing of our sins. And we see there that the sin offerings were all there picturing that Christ would bear our sin one day. And the guilt offering, chapter 5, verse 14 through 6, 7, and 7, 1 through 10, his payment for the damage of sin. A lot of people are carrying a lot of guilt around. And I always think of David. And in Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, David cries out because the guilt was so heavy. Could have been up to a year that David lived in that sin of killing Uriah because he went and slept with his wife and got her pregnant. That's, that's a sum up the story. <laughs> that's a man after God's own heart. And he knew the consequences of that. Because remember when Nathan told him a little story about the lamb? <laughs> David got ticked off. I think we ought to kill that guy and blah, blah, blah. You ought to pay it back. And he's getting all mad. And then David, and then Nathan goes, uh, guess what? You're the man. <laughs> That's what he said. You're the man. And David goes. And I'm not for sure if he wasn't relieved as much as he was condemned. Because for a year he's been hiding that. Sin's been, he says in the psalm that sin was making him sick. He was weary and heavy. That's what happens when a Christian can't have fellowship with their Heavenly Father. They get sick, they get weak, they get weary. And uh, if you don't keep fellowship up with God and, and sin gets in and, and guilt comes. And God says there, that, and David says, remove the guilt. Wash me. Will you clean me up? I I, I can't take it any longer. And God did. He forgave him. God washed him clean. But always remember, there's consequences to sin. There's always consequences, and David had to live with those. And uh, that, that's the way it works. There's the law of the offerings. And then in chapters 8 through 10, as we back up just a little bit there, chapters 8 through 10, we have the laws concerning the priesthood. Boy, this, this is amazing. This section describes the specific duty of the priest. What he was to wear. He, he had to wear certain clothing that God prescribed. How to prepare. Which animals to sacrifice. You know, they had the clean animals, the unclean. All, all this stuff. And how to offer them. Some they could burn the whole animal up. Some they couldn't. Some they kept. Some they ate. <laughs> Where to stand. Had to stand in a certain place. What to say. You know, we have a lot of that um, ritualism in, in so-called religious systems today. Everything is laid out for them. If they do communion, well, they have a written script that most of them have memorized. And uh, that's what they had to do. They had to know what to say, what to drink, what not to drink, and what to eat and what not to eat. Everybody ready to sign up? That would have had to be a hard... I said, praise God that I'm under New Testament and under grace. I don't have any script that I have to fill. <laughs> I don't have anything that I have to pray, that I have to say. Uh, just uh, what God lays on my heart as I study his word and prepare and talk to him. And I can be real. I, I, I've been in front of pastors. I, went, I used to go to a pastor's conference out in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I watched a couple pastors, well-known pastors. They were so to the book. They weren't real. They, they weren't like Chuck Swindoll, who just laughs. He can be so serious, the next thing you know, he can laugh. Dr. Jeremiah tells jokes all the time. Tells jokes. So is Dr. Swindoll. These guys are real. And, and you can understand they've been through these things. You feel like they're a real person. They're not just a puppet up there uh, performing for you. 
uh, the guys uh, that I watched, they, their hand motions were all mechanical. And how they read the scriptures. And, and, and no pre-recorded music, Bob. That, that's sinful. And Jim. Especially don't you have no drums in that music. Because that's from the devil. Come on. Let's be real. We're people of God. God says enjoy him. Live a life. God knows that you're all individuals. Everybody in here is different. Some of us are more different than others. That's all right. Linda's pointing at herself. I wasn't going to say anything about you, Linda, because I don't think you're different. You're a lot like the rest of us. And uh, anyhow, but God said there was a way to do things. And there is a way to do church. You know that there is a way to do church and be Christ honoring. And we want to do that. And we can have fun doing it. And we can also be serious when we do it. Uh, and we can do both of those things. And I, like I said, I always think Chuck Swindoll had one of the best balances of doing that. Uh, of, of doing that. Chapter 10 will show us what happens when you don't do things the way God says. Chapter 10. And we're going to see the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. They're priests. The, it says, then Nadab and Abihu, chapter 10, verse 1, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane or strange, depends on which translation you have, fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded. So he, they're doing something that he didn't set forth for the priest to do. <laughs> I'm so glad that God's gracious because <laughs> it goes on. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them. And they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace then Moses called Mishael and Eliphan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Come near, carry, out, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them by their tunics out of the camp, and Moses, as Moses has said. I tell you what, God gave a little lesson to the family. You remember I'm holy. He says, If you don't, this is what happens. You do it the way I say. You just don't walk into the presence of a holy God. <laughs> it's over. You say, well, that's Old Testament. Remember the New Testament? About a couple who sold their property and lied about it? Ananias and Sapphira? <laughs> they walked into, he did first, told this story, and guess what happened? He died. <laughs> he died. Peter says, why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? And then in comes his wife, not knowing that they just drugged the body out. She told the same story. Guess what? He said, why do you lie to God? Now, it's funny. One time Holy Spirit, one time God. That tells you one thing, right? God and Holy Spirit, same people. They're part of the Trinity. She died. It says the people around there were scared. <laughs> they feared the Lord. Same thing here. They need to remember that God is holy. And without the shed blood of Christ, you could never get into his presence. It's not possible. God has never taken worship lightly and neither should we. Even when we do the communion time, what does it say to do? Examine yourself. Make sure when you come into that time that you dealt with the sin in your life, whatever it may be. Deal with it. Or goes on to say that, guess what? If you don't, God will. It says some of you are asleep. That means dead. <laughs> That's a good dead. Because that means you're with the Lord. But you're still not in the picture. God does deal with sin. He always does. You, what you sow... You shall reap. And, and, and that's a New Testament thing. Laws for purity. Chapters 11 through 17. Laws for purity. 
God here shows again the distance between a holy God and sinful humanity. Jesus did that well. The Pharisees and the Sadducees used to say, well, if you broke this law and you broke that law, and the Lord says, what about what you thought in your heart? I used to tell folks that all the time. Uh, when I witnessed on the streets of Milwaukee to the Catholic, a lot of Catholic folks there, uh, they say they're practicing Catholics, but they would say, we live by the Ten Commandments, always. I almost always got that answer. I said, could you tell me the Ten Commandments? Uh, well, see, uh, well, they'd list two or three, but they couldn't list the whole things. And I said, well, how do you know? And, and then they would talk about murder. I said, that's perfect. Because what did Jesus say about murder? If you hate someone in your heart, it's just as bad as being a murderer. See, it's the attitude in there and the heart attitude. And so he shows us that even if you thought something bad, have you ever said, boy, I'd like to wipe that guy right off the face of the earth, right? <laughs> or I'd like to punch her lights right out. Yeah. There's a couple folks that I see every once in a while, I think that. I say, uh-oh. <laughs> Lord, I'm sorry. Because that shouldn't be my attitude. Uh, I, I, there's still God's creation. There's still hope. That they might get saved. So I pray for them. Even though I sometimes don't think that way about them. And uh, you know it's the same way with family. We have family. We don't love all the family. We have to like them. But we don't love them all. Right. And that's just the way it is. God has never. And so God says there's a, a, a big, big gap. And he talks about cleanness and uncleanness of diet. You might wonder about that. How come you can eat this and how come you couldn't eat that in the Old Testament? God had reasons for that. Hygiene. Don't forget hygiene today. Uh, it's still important. Uh, disease. How to treat that in the day of atonement. So we get the way to approach God was through those offerings the blood sacrifice that we might get into his presence and have fellowship with him. And I'm going to stop here at the end of this one so we can pick up next time. Now that God has laid out specifics for approaching God in chapters 1 through 17, now he says these are the requirements that you have if you want to walk with God. So now you're into his presence and now you're his child and that comes right into our life today. Now how should I live now that I'm his child? That's what he's going to do in the book of Leviticus.